Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last talk of the day. Um, this talk is, uh, you know, you can see the title, it's Beyond Serverless. The, the subtitle, though, How Feature-Focused Platforms Streamline Your Developer Experience. The, what, the, the point I was trying to make there, and I, I tried to describe this in the abstract of the talk, was that um, I've been working on something for about the last year that really allowed me to focus more on the, the, the pure implementation of features and spend a, lot, a less time on everything else. And that's what was the, kind of the inspiration for this talk. So I was working with something specific that I'll, I'll, I'll cover a little bit in this talk, but it led me to look around at other technologies that are providing this same type of thing, which is fundamentally abstracting away a lot of complexity, which allows us to focus more time on implementing features. Because if you really think about it, we're, you know, we're paid as software developers and architects, IT teams. You know, if one, actually think about entire IT organizations, I think one way to look at it is that we're here to pump out features for the business, for the users, to get software out there to actually drive the business. And now I'm kind of thinking of things where if you're not doing that feature development, it, you're doing these other things that are kind of the, almost, I'm looking at it like they're the necessary evil, but they're a distraction from feature development, but we spend, and it varies considerably from, from organization to team to person, what the ratio is, but the ratio can be pretty extreme where you're spending a lot of time on everything else, particularly infrastructure and dealing with infrastructure and proportionally less time on implementing features. So that's the inspiration for this talk. So I screwed up on the t in the abstract and I'm gonna cover uh, four uh, solutions, you know, what I'm calling higher abstraction solutions. And one I screwed up, is, I, I said in the abstract is sky, but it's actually fly. So my bad, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm dyslexic, I guess. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm more visual than textual. I get. So anyways, I caught it too late, but I fixed it. So we're gonna cover these four abstraction, uh, or these four high abstraction solutions. They're, they're all a bit different from each other, but they're all trying to achieve the same thing. But before I get started, there's a lot of information I'm going to try and provide very, very quickly. So one of the things I thought I'd do is just give you a lot of QR codes that you could use as references if you're interested in a particular area. And I've got a QR code for this presentation at the end if you just want to grab the entire presentation. But there's a lot of, um, of these you know, QR codes in, in my slides. But I wanted to start with this, um, this video because this is a guy I follow a lot on YouTube. He's got a channel called Web Dev Simplified. He's got like 1.3 million followers. And he talks about web development. 1.3 million followers. It's amazing. Uh, but he's, he's really good. And he pumps out videos at a high rate. And he, so he has to keep learning, learning and learning new things and try and explain it to people. So he, he did this video not um, recently that his process for how to learn fast. So it's a great reference. I, I highly recommend you check out this video because this, this is a real skill that I think many of us need to have is how to learn something new as quickly as possible. So he broke it down into these kind of five steps, you know, what and why, getting started and so on. And I'm going to follow this a, a bit in, in the way I structured this presentation. But I want to start with what do I mean by abstraction layers? And I, you know, so I have this little 3D diagram and there's like six layers here. And I'm going to work from the bottom up. So at the very bottom, you can see there's hardware and then virtualization and containers and so on. But what you, you're going to see as I introduce some of these four different high abstraction solutions is how do they abstract away the, these underlying technologies. So the first one to get extracted away, and this was around the, the early 2000s, was we went from using actual physical hardware to going to virtualization. And that really came on very quickly. I remember when this happened, and it was like almost overnight. From, from in, in one year, we all had physical machines that, we, that were allocated to us you know, for testing, for development, and, and uh, for production. 
And the next year, it was like everything went virtual. And I remember there was some grumbling and complaining, but pretty quickly, everybody just settled in. And it was like overnight hardware just disappeared. And we just lived on this virtual uh, abstraction layer. But that was great, especially for the people that are, were running the infrastructure, because it gave them more control of how they allocate the infrastructure. But for, develop, you know, for deploying applications in particular, you still have the problem of every machine that you deployed to, a virtual machine, still had the same challenges in that they were slightly different, different versions of libraries, different versions of the operating system, that you know, the, 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 the deployment targets were different. And that was a problem that was addressed by containerization. And, and Docker came online around, I think, 2012, 13, where the, the containers became much more mainstream and if, if, you know, still are today. And the nice thing about containers, of course, is that they hide the, the actual physical infrastructure or virtual infrastructure that your code is running in. They, they kind of encapsulate your, your application code in a well-defined environment that looked like you know, a computer, but from the perspective of the application code, but the containers were hiding that. It, so they are abstracting away that level. But then now we had a lot of containers to run. Lots and lots of containers. You know, you know, one machine could run many containers. So then uh, the problem became orchestrating containers. So this was a huge one. And this was around 2017 or so when Kubernetes became, you know, just kind of exploded on the scene. The scene. And today I think that um, I kind of look at things from this perspective in like three epochs. There's pre-Kubernetes, you know, what did we do? You know, what, were, what was our runtime environments looking, looking like pre-Kubernetes? Is what's, what does the runtime environment look like now? And I think we're firmly into the Kubernetes epoch. But then, what's after Kubernetes? And that's kind of what I want to talk about, I mean, what's coming beyond Kubernetes. But Kubernetes had a huge impact on things, that it, it kind of took all kinds of infrastructure, infrastructure resources and introduced an entirely new playing field that you could just run things. You could, and you could do things like declaratively say, here's my app. I want five instances of this app to run. I don't care where you run it. Just run it for me. Manage the network and, and persistence and those types of things. If things break, don't bother me. Just fix it yourself. You know, so there was this very clean abstraction that Kubernetes provided that we're just you know, reaping the benefits of it. But still, Kubernetes comes with its, you know, its own challenges, uh, especially because I think in many cases, what was also happening was more and more the responsibility for dealing with the infrastructure was get, getting pushed to the developers that we didn't have to deal with before. So, but now it's like things like, yeah, as a developer or a development team, we're responsible for figuring out how we use Kubernetes. We're responsible for all these different things and you know, more things that we had to, to deal with. So, but there's things happening where Kubernetes is getting abstracted away. And this next layer, where I'm just calling it databases and other services, it's been around forever. Databases have been around you know, forever. Uh, I've been programming for a very, very long time. And I've seen, I was around when CQ, you know, SQL came out and other databases and, you know, it, it, these are very powerful abstractions, very mature. We're also very dependent on them. And, and um, but these things, and, you know, other services are things like security and you know, message buses and, and so on. And then finally, where we're heading, and this is where I think we're in the early days of this, is that we're as much as possible, things are abstracted away. That you're focusing on the implementation of an application and you're not having, you don't even know what the infrastructure looks like that your application is running on. You don't care. You, you care about you know, really the core features of the application itself. So this is where we're going. I, and we, you know, we're already there in some cases. So the four high abstractions uh, that I want to go through is Fermion, Dapper, Fly, and Calyx. Full disclosure, I, I work for the company. You can see I got a Calyx t-shirt. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt when I, when you, when I talk about Calyx, because I get 
tend to get kind of enthusiastic about it. But I think all the four of these things are very cool because of what they do. But, and, but they approach the problem in different ways, which is really interesting. So the first one I wanted to talk about is, is Fermion. So Fermion is a company that, that is focusing on providing a solution for using WebAssembly to deploy applications. And the, I, I love their, their claim to fame is, you know, from blinking cursor to deployed app in less than two minutes. They got a pretty good website that, uh, you know, they go into, you know, explaining what they do. They've got this tool called Spin. It's all open source. Um, it shows, you know, starting up a new project and, and those types of things. It's, um, but the, what's interesting about Fermion is their use of WebAssembly. Now, WebAssembly is really interesting as well in that what it provides is a way to run code from the browser to the edge. So you can take things like Go and Rust and even Java, but you can take uh, languages that are not native to running in the browser and run them natively in the browser. But you can also use that same technology to deploy and run applications in the cloud. And also, the edge is getting to be a big deal now and using that same approach to, to deploy to the edge. So it's like from the full gauntlet uh, from browser to edge that they're, they're providing a solution for with WebAssembly. And Fermion is, is focusing on providing it in the cloud. This video is a great video. Uh, I, you know, there's, as usual, there's a ton of videos, good videos on uh, things <clears throat> on YouTube. But this one I came across, I thought was one of the best that I, that I saw about. If you're interested in WebAssembly, this guy did a really good job of explaining what it is. But the, with the why of Fermion, there's, they, they've got what they call the Fermion Cloud, which is their, their you know, paid for solution. You, know, you, you, uh, you set up an account and you, you know, they start charging you to run your application. But they also have a, a, a platform. And the, this cloud is really nice. And here's, this is where um, I thought was, you know, this is what you're looking for without any infrastructure set up. So this is where it's abstracting away. You know, Fermion is a solution where they're abstracting away the infrastructure. You don't have, you're, you're paying them to run the infrastructure. You don't know what the infrastructure looks like. You don't care. You're focused on the applications and a really simple, elegant develop, deployment model for running the applications. But with the, with the platform, this is the open source piece. So if you want to run it yourself, you can do that. So they kind of have the best of both worlds. You want to pay them to run your application? Or do you want to you, do you have the resources and the infrastructure on premise to run it yourself? You can go either direction. So they've got nice coverage in, in both different ways. I'm a Java developer, so I was really curious about Java and WebAssembly. It's a little weird right now. I've got a couple of links to some articles about Java and WebAssembly. They're, they're making some progress there. So if you're a Java developer, you'd have to check that out. But for things like Go and Rust and so on, um, they really got that well covered. It, you know, like I say, WebAssembly, you could take Go or Rust and deploy to, to uh, browsers. The getting started, they, they've got some really good tools for you know, getting started. They've got a CLI that, uh, you, that, that that this, they call spin. You just you can just in, uh, install that very quickly, set up an account, and basically uh, do a deployment, and you're up and running wherever their cloud's running. So it's 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 got all that. It's it's so it's got a good getting started experience, and from a kind of what abstractions layer are they uh, layers are they abstracting away? I think the nice thing is, is that they're abstracting away the, 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 most of the infrastructure. You, you're probably still going to be relying on external databases and you know, things like Kafka or whatever if you need that. But as far as the application code, uh, that, you know, that's really just regular application code, but you're not worrying about things like Kubernetes and scaling and clustering and, and auto-scaling and scaling up and down, things like that. That's what uh, the, the, the platform or their Fermion Cloud is taken care of. Uh, and again, the platform, you can own everything, and you can run it all yourself. You, but you still have that nice abstraction layer for the application code, 
while you still have teams that are behind, you know, kind of behind the scenes running uh, the infrastructure. So the next one is Dapper, and this is Distributed Application Runtime. This is from Microsoft. And this one is another really interesting one, approaching the problem in a completely different way. And the, the, um, you know, their claim to fame here is APIs for building portable and reliable microservices. And this is in a, the, this API tries to make the application code, not tries, but the goal is it makes the application code technology agnostic. So the, it is all open source. They, as far as I know, they don't have their own runtime environment for doing this. It's really more of this is open source, you use it the way you want. It's, you have full control of the infrastructure like the Fermium platform does. And it provides this really interesting approach for abstracting away um, the, the underlying infrastructure. So the, in the concepts, what they've done, go into the overview section here, is they've got, they've defined in, in their API, they've got what they call components. And you use the, an API to do these different patterns of, of uh, implementation, like pub sub or state management is kind of a, a, their form of doing CRUD. Uh, actors, which is something I'm, my company is very actively involved in, the actor model is another thing. But these, you write your code using their API, so it's, tech, you know, like if you're doing PubSub, your code doesn't know if it's talking to Kafka or Redis or uh, Pulsar or those types of different things. But through configuration, you configure your software components into the different actual implementations. So it, it could be at, at, run, at test time or development time, you're using Redis, say for PubSub. But in production, you could be using Kafka. But you don't change any code. You just change the configuration. So that's a really interesting approach, I think, to how things work. And they're getting started is very much the same way. Um, you just, there's a, a Dapper API. You go into a project, you, initiate, you do an init, um, you can run things, and uh, you know, just look at different processes. So you just use the CLI to, to get things going. So it's another uh, API-based type of solution. But this is kind of a hot issue for me. And I was watching a presentation from somebody talking about Dapper. And this is, but I, I grabbed this. It's a screenshot, so it's a little fuzzy. But what they were showing was, here's a, a little service. And I underlined and kind of pointed arrows at it. This does this one operation called save state, async. And then for, a little bit further on, it publishes the event. But I, when I saw that, it's like, OK, there's a problem with this code. And the problem is that in between those two operations, we're basically jumping a gap. These things, these two operations happen at different times. You know, the first, at one time, we save the state. And the next time, we publish to, uh, you know, to uh, PubSub, you know, Kafka or something. But what can go wrong here? Well, this guy is trying to jump across his chasm, and he might make it. He might not. It looks like a pretty aggressive jump. So I always try and point this out. You know, I, and I think of this as you're jumping the valley of doom here, right? Because what can happen? At the worst possible moment, you get a failure right in this red zone. So after the time that you saved the state, but before the code could get to the point where it could do that uh, publish event, fails. So what do you got? You've just introduced the feature with a leaky pipe. So this is a very common scenario, I think. It's too, all too easy to do this, where you've got this leaky pipe, where it could be that 99.9 something percent of all of your operations make it. But every once in a while, you get a little drip, and you just lost some data, or something got corrupted. And 
you start scrambling around trying to figure out, going through all kinds of tracing and everything to try and figure out what's happening. But basically, you've written an application where it works most of the time, but not all the time, that you have kind of this deliberate problem. And I don't think users and our management likes it when you say, well, it works most of the time. Users, no, it, that doesn't fly too well. It's, um, so this is why I think it's what, one thing to look for in these kinds of solutions is that they should guide you in a way that makes it easy to do things right and hard to do things wrong. And this is where I, I, don't, I, I really like Dapper, and I hate to pick on them on, on this one thing, because it's not just them. This is a common problem that it's all too easy to do. And uh, so anyways. So Dapper is very cool. It approaches things very differently. From the perspective of your application code, it's totally agnostic to the infrastructure. And it's very portable. So you can write it using one infrastructure implementation, like a certain database or a certain pub sub, and later on change those, those infrastructure components without having to change a bunch of code. That's what's really unique about Dapper. And at the same time, this is really good for people that want to own, you know, they want to run everything on premise, which is still very popular. Some companies, because of regulation or by choice, don't want to go to the cloud. So the next one is Fly. And Fly is very interesting because their claim to fame is you can deploy app servers. Like, say you have a full stack JavaScript you know, TypeScript type of an app, and you have a front end and a back end piece to it, and you need some place to deploy your back end fast. And Fly is a great platform for doing this. And, but their claim to fame is you can do it where it, it runs close to the users. And what do, they, what do I mean by that? You know, so the using Fly is, again, it has a CLI, Fly Control, or just Fly. But what they've done is they have their own worldwide infrastructure and you deploy your application to fly kind of worldwide. And then you can very, very easily with the CLI say, I want to run it in North America. I want to run it in Europe. I want to run it in Asia Pacific somewhere. Wherever your, the activity is, you, you want your application code to be running as close as possible to the users to reduce latency. They, they make that very, very easy for uh, developers to do. So it's, it's a, um, they've de deployed their own bare metal service. There's a really interesting story about how their technology works, but um, they just make it you know, very straightforward for doing this worldwide deployment. And they also deploy uh, Postgres for you. If, so if, if that's, uh, it, often you need an, app, an application needs a database, right? So if you just, it's like this is a vanilla flavored uh, application, Needs a nice SQL database. Postgres works fine. Boom! There you go. You got you got the ingredients for for running tons and tons of different types of apps. And this this whole thing of of deploying to different locations. There's about I counted earlier today. There's about 34 different geographic locations, and you can see they all have these three letter. Um, uh, abbreviations. So you just, when you deploy, you can de just say, I want to deploy to Hong Kong and LAX and Madrid. Done. And, and your, your application is up and running in those things. And you can manage them through their CLI. The other cool thing that they do is Fly understands a lot of technology. So forgive me for picking Rails, but this was a, a decent example. I just want to show you. No offense to anybody that does Rails development. But you just go into, an, you go into your project directory, and you say fly launch. And you, you can see what it did here. It scans the code, and it goes, oh, I detect that this is a Rails app. So, so fly knows how to deploy a Rails app to its cloud. It'll do the same thing with tons of different types of projects, from Go to Rust to uh, React to Python and then, oh, Docker. So it, it really, it, it's pretty simple for deploying all kinds of different apps without a lot of drama. Here's an example of uh, when you're deploying, and it just gives you the list of, of, of geographic regions where you can deploy to, and you can pick wherever you want to deploy to. 
And then with the database, the database is also interesting. You can just say you, know, you want to create a database, you set it up, and then you say what regions you want it to run in. And then what you can also do is you can have like you can have one instance of a write in, uh, instance of the database and multiple satellite instances of read-only instances of the database. So um, you can distribute the read-only instance of the database close geographically, close to where the users are at, which I thought was a very unique thing. Again, very, very simply through their, their API, which is uh, very cool. Getting started is, is um, sorry, getting started is very simple as well. I played around this a bit myself um, just to, to try it out, and I was really amazed how, how easy it was to just get things up and running anywhere in the world. Without even, I mean, it takes a bit of work sometimes to, to deploy things, you know, like an Amazon or Google or, or whatever to, uh, to different regions and, and so on. This was really simple to, to use. So I see Fly as being, um, it's abstracting away everything, ex uh, and even the database in some cases, but if you don't use their Postgres database, you can still use other uh, external services to fly. I think that would still work. Uh, so it's, it's a very nice solution. So the final one is uh, Calyx. Again, I work for Lightbend, which is the company behind Calyx, but Calyx is a uh, same type of thing. It's a platform for, it's, a, it's a, well, let me show you here. It's a platform as a service for running microservices, basically. And the, one of the, I think some of the unique characteristics of Calyx is that your code doesn't know or touch directly a database for persistence. A database is being used, but it's abstracted away. Your code doesn't touch or know anything about messaging, but messaging is done by Calyx. So the, the abstraction doesn't just go to the platform, it goes into the the SDKs that you're using to build the applications. And this is what got me started on this, this topic was this, this idea of, as a developer and a designer, I was focused on really just the core essence of the application, and I didn't have to worry at all about, even at the code level, like connecting to databases and, and think, or connecting to message buses and so on, using those, their, those different APIs. And it's a relatively simple programming model. Um, we're all about, it, it's really focused on the developer experience, and actually we're working a lot on that uh, right now. And uh, the, one of the big things here is um, that you know, from a platform perspective, there is no ops. It just, just very much like Fermion, you know, Fermion, Cloud, they, they, they run the, the entire infrastructure for you. That's what, what, what's happening in, in Calyx as well. The entire infrastructure is being run for you by the plat our platform team. You're just focused on the applications and take, you know, giving the application, just deploy and say, run it for me. You, know, you take, scale it up, scale it down, things fail, restart them. You know, internally, it's using Kubernetes and, and databases and um, different things like that, but uh, those are all just completely abstracted away. So conceptually, let me see if I can find it. Um, the, the programming model is really pretty straightforward. I just want to, want to show you the, I think it's here. You know, it's, um, it's, very familiar, it, this is Java, but very familiar to say, uh, you know, annotation based and to say uh, like Spring developers, things like that. It actually uses Spring Boot for certain aspects of the application. Um, but the code is very agnostic to the underlying uh, environment. There's two approaches. You can use the annotation based approach for, you know, it's kind of like code first programming, or you can use uh, API approach, and this is a protobuf. So there's kind of two different ways you can use to define applications and build them. Uh, I prefer the annotation approach myself. Uh, the protobuf one is um, nice as, as well. But the uh, getting started is the same thing uh, as the other ones. You know, there's a CLI. But even that, you know, like setting up a project is just a Maven archetype. 
There's very few dependencies on other libraries in the code. You know, there's just a minimal amount of dependencies because you just don't need things like the databases and message buses and so on in our, our application code. The, uh, here's, here's the Spring Boot application. You know, the, the, the things are, are, we're using it, uh, Spring Boot to actually start things up in the uh, annotation-based approach. But the real fun, this is a demo that I've been working on. My, I'm a developer advocate, so I don't have to write production code anymore. I've done, I've done about four decades of that, and I'm done with it. So now I get to write you know, demo code, which is a lot more fun, especially because you don't have quite as uh, the deadlines that you typically have you know, for when you're getting paid to write production code. In any case, there's... Um, in this di design diagram, you can see there's three different shapes. There's these you know, kind of diagonal squares. Those are called entities. There's a, they're like very tight, very focused, very loosely coupled microservices. The Vs are for views. So this is CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. So the, the, the microservices focus on creating data and changing the state of data, and the views focus on reading the data, that, and that's CQRS. And then those little diamond-shaped things are, are called actions, which are stateless, serverless functions. So what happens is that this application is completely event-driven in that you can see, like, a message goes in to say this first service. It emits events that I'm showing the highlighted lines that go to another service. It tr that service gets triggered to perform some operation. It emits events. So you can see these events are just cascading through the system. This is the way this application works. It's completely event-driven. And um, it's, a, it's really fun to build applications this way, especially in an event-driven way, where um, you have these very loosely coupled, very tightly focused types of, of um, services that are ignorant of each other, but they work together because of the way they're wired together. And when I was going through and initially putting together this design diagram, you know, I was kind of seeing this, this flow. And you know, AI is huge right now, right? I mean, since early this year, when it really hit the mainstream, everybody's going nuts with AI. I am as well. And I thought, and I've, I've been, I've been kind of interested in the way neural networks work and the way the brain works and things like that. And I thought, I, I was starting to see, wait a minute, this is behaving very much like a uh, neurons. Neurons have a signal come in that could trigger a neuron to emit a signal that goes to other neurons, and they could cascade all around in our, our brain with you know, 100 billion neurons in it and trillions of connections. So I want to show you something. I just got this working like last week, and it's a visualization of real activity in this, this Earthship demo. And um, so this is like one order coming into the system. And then another one came in in green. And then the third one came in in this other color. But now watch what happens when about 200 orders come in. And this is real activity happening in the system. I, I scraped the logs, and this is slowed down. But what you're seeing is that this, what this application does is orders come in, and then stock gets allocated to the orders. And the red is things that where there was insufficient stock that they went into a back order state. But then the system is recognizing that it needs more stock, so no more stock comes into the system, and that new stock goes hunting for those back ordered items. So you can see eventually all the red and yellow turns green, which means the orders have been allocated stock. And again, this is real time, and right at the very end, you can see a little bit of flurry of activity of, of the region. But um, this is not just a 2D rendering. This actually took hours to, gener to render the video. It's a minute and a half. But there's about 10,000 of these dots. And these are instances of those, those diagonal services. And every line represents a real event, at least one event, that flowed through the system. So this was a really interesting way to build uh, you know, kind of a, a new perspective, I think, on the behavior of event-driven systems when you have a platform that allows you to focus just on those kinds of things. And this is what all four of these different types of solutions are, are letting us do, is, is focus on these types of solutions. And I'm 
very excited. You know, I'm, I've, I've been playing around with this name called um, Micromind. It's still controversial in my company, um, and we're still talking about it. it it's it, very bleeding edge, cutting edge kind of thinking. Man, I could be completely crazy, but when I watched this video and I finally got this working um, and I could see the real activity in the system, I said, wait a minute, this, this looks like the behavior of a kind of a, a neural system. And also what was interesting was that what emerged from this was that there's patterns that emerge. Like there's 13 of these different entity types. Each of these different spheres represents a different entity type. Each one's doing a, a certain part of the processing. And the, um, the top three spheres, the big ones, are doing, I call them reduction trees. And so it's these common patterns were starting to emerge. And it's like of the 13 entity instances here, five of them use recurring patterns, just in this one little implementation. So it's a, it's a really fascinating way to look at event-driven type, event types of systems. So this is not um, large language models approach. This is very simplistic. This type of system doesn't hallucinate. It doesn't have a warning that, well, I might make mistakes. This is very, very precise computing. Anything that anything can happen in the system. Something could break anywhere and get restarted and the system will pick up where it left off and will not corrupt data. That's the type of systems that we're getting to build on these new types of uh, high abstraction platforms. So it's very exciting um, times, I think, in these new platforms. And we'll see where things go, but uh, I'm very, very stoked about this. Anyways, Calix abstracts away everything. No ops, no database, no message bus. You're just focusing on the behavior of the system and you're really focused. One approach is you can really focus on just going nuts with event-driven types of applications, which I think are ideal for distributed systems and dealing with the realities of things breaking and restarting all the time and not corrupting data and not having to worry about it when, you know, while you're in production. So I want to leave you with a couple of things. One is this video. I absolutely love this video. This, this video is by a guy named Brett Victor, who is a fantastic speaker. It's the future programming. It's the, this QR code is for his Netflix uh, video. He did this video in 2013, and he was pretending he was a developer in 1973, talking about what computing would be like 40 years in the future, in, in 2013. He actually dressed like a developer in 1973. He's got a pocket protector and, and a white long sleeve shirt. And notice that he's using an overhead projector. It's an awesome talk. And one of the things he said at the end, I think, is the most profound. He, he said, the most dangerous thought that you can have as a creative person, which we all are, is to think that we know what we're doing. Because once you think you know what you're doing, you stop looking around for other ways of doing things. And you stop being able to see other ways of doing things. You become blind. If you don't want to be this person, if you want to be open and receptive to new ways of thinking, to invent new ways of thinking, I think the first step is you have to say to yourself, I don't know what I'm doing. And as a field, we have to say, we don't know what we're doing. And once you truly understand that, and once you truly believe that, then you're free and you can think anything. And he really makes a strong point about that. So I can't recommend this video enough. Now, another thing, we and we saw this in the opening keynote about unlearning. And I, I love this quote by Alvin Toffler. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who not, cannot learn and unlearn. That's the key. Unlearn and then relearn. We have to be able to, willing to let go of the things that we know well and we're comfortable with and get into those uncomfortable zones. In the keynote, he, he really expressed this very eloquently, and I think this is an extremely important skill set. And finally, to scare the crap out of you a little bit, um, I like this statement. This one's brand, you know, very, very new. Uh, AI will not replace you. People using AI will. This one, I think, is very profound. The, the code I use to write, uh, to do the rendering for the 3D, the tool I use is Blender. 
I've been using Blender for a long time, but I never did what's called Blender scripting. It's in Python. And Blender has this huge API. So what I did is I, my co-programmer was ChatGPT. I went to ChatGPT and I, and I method by method, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to do it in the Blender API in Python. So iteratively with my co-programmer, who was an expert on the Blender API, I just used it and I wrote in days what it probably would have taken me a couple months to write. So I, be, I went from a novice Blender API Python developer to I think an expert developer where I could write something like what I did for the 3D rendering um, so quickly. It was, it's a, it was amazing. This is the new skill set. This is, I think this is very, very profound. Uh, and this just goes along with this whole thing of these new platforms that are abstracting things away. One of the big resistances we're seeing when we talk to people about something like Calyx is they want to know how it works on the inside. We got to explain how everything works, how we use Kubernetes and everything. It's like, dude, you got to let go of this stuff. <laughs> you need to focus on what you can do with the new thing, not so much dwell on, on the past. Uh, but it's just human nature. This is, it's hard for us to let go, but it's, that's a really critical skill that, that I think we need to adopt. So that's all I got. Um, thank you very much for being here on the last session. Uh, and we have, I think we have some time for some questions if anybody has any questions. But I really appreciate you taking the time to be, to be here. Any questions? Anybody using any of these things or heard about you know, Fermion or Dapper or Fly? Go to Dapper. Dapper is probably the most popular one. Um, but the other ones are interesting as well. <laughs> well he, he works for Lightman. He doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't go. All right. Um, if you uh, want to contact me, my, my major focus right now is on event-driven systems, this whole micromind idea. Uh, I talked to somebody last week that, that you know, somebody out in the wild, I, I'm from the U.S., but uh, this guy was in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, and he re talk, yeah, reached out and wanted to talk about some stuff, and I said, let's set up a meeting. So if you guys, anybody's interested in talking about this stuff, I'd love to hear from you. So feel free to reach me at, uh, reach me at um, you can reach me on uh, LinkedIn or, t or Twitter is easy. All right. Thanks a lot, guys.